Hey! Wanna walk to- Hey! Hey! Wanna talk about trash TV? Andrew, you are not the <laughs> father! I made this for you. So sorry. Quick disclaimer before we start that this video is sponsored by Skillshare. Once again, they've stepped in to help support this episode. What is Skillshare, you might ask? Well, Skillshare is an online learning tool used by thousands of creators across a variety of disciplines, a service you can use to get educated in the fields of art, business, design and more. The site currently has more than 25,000 classes available, for both experts looking to hone their knowledge of their field, or laymen looking to pick up a new trick. Want to learn about iPhone videography? CeeLo de la Paz has a class on it. But whatever it is you're looking for, for less than 10 bucks a month, you can snag an annual subscription and dive in today, joining more than 7 million users already signed up. And once again, you can get a free 2 months of the service if you use the offer code listed down below. NEAT! So a few weeks ago, I flew out to come visit the UK, and scrolling through trending news to get up to date on the goings on, uh, you might expect what I'd want to talk about is the fact that Brexit is still a mess, and Theresa May has apparently resigned, um, and now Boris Johnson's probably going to be the Prime Minister. So Jeremy Kyle got cancelled, eh? So in case you're not aware, the Jeremy Kyle show is a sort of Jerry Springer-esque family drama talk show uh, that's been pretty solidly popular in UK daytime TV for about 14 years now. It's a show mostly comprised of low-income families talking about such issues as My son is jealous of my cancer-stricken husband Your son can't be mine because he's ginger and has my son cut up my sex toy? And almost always the structure of the show would be that there's sort of conflicting narratives from multiple parties, um, and it would be something like, oh, you stole something, or oh, you cheated on me, and then they'd bring out the lie detector, which is accurate in over 99% of cases, and then that would decide who was lying, who were telling the truth. And if the original accuser turned out to be the one who was lying, they'd now be the bad guy. Uh, if the one who was accused turned out to be lying, they would be forced to either deny everything or sort of collapse into a heap of tears and sadness and beg the jeering audience for forgiveness. You know, it's trash TV. It's sensational and provocative and kind of useless as actual therapeutic practice, but like... It's not really why you're watching it, right? But then, on May of this year, something different happened after a guest was outed as having cheated on their partner based on the lie detector test. That guest killed themselves. And so, obviously, show was off the air. They had hundreds of complaints. ITV removed the whole show from their archives. Uh, Kyle was out. It had all gone sort of too far. And what I was sort of left with was a question that I'd seen pop up in comment section a few times. What really changed here? Like, what had really changed about the style of Kyle's content that meant he had to be punished in this way? If Kyle's content continued to be basically what it had been for over a decade, deliberately coaxing out these big family meltdowns on live TV, what was the line that he'd suddenly crossed, and why did he cross it? And as I thought about the answer, I realised it pertained not just specifically to Jeremy Kyle, but kind of to this wider discussion of trash TV as a genre, and then even from that, uh, sort of broader points about the culture that created trash TV. So, I've got like 20 minutes. Let's chat. They've turned the weans against us. A final disclaimer that this video will not be pursuing the idea that all of this is stage theatre. Reports remain incredibly mixed on that, especially for the shows I'm focusing on here, so while it's an interesting line of questioning, life's easier if we ignore it for today. Now on with the show. So, the line. 
the invisible line of ethics we seem to only recognise is there at the exact moment we agree the line has been crossed. If you're familiar with my channel, you know I've covered this sort of topic in the past. One of my first videos was on the Plain Bay controversy, in which a cute story involving an airplane couple became a weird social media stalking campaign fairly rapidly. More recently I did a video on hoaxes and how we decide when a work of fiction has gone too far in trying to blend reality with fantasy. I've included links for them so you're free to check them out, but I think for Trash TV, I want to go a different route. So when it comes to shows like Jerry Springer, Jeremy Kyle, Dr. Phil, Maury, what is it that viewers come for in the first place? On the surface, it's a pretty easy question entertainment. But obviously, that can mean a lot of different things. You don't get the same thing out of an ice cream as you do from a nice cream. In all honesty, if I had to connect the specific kind of entertainment viewers get out of watching shows like Springer and Kyle, it's probably the gallows. Like, we don't tune in out of a general desire for dramatic tension or comedy, there's tons of fiction for that. What I think we really want is to see, live on TV, somebody's life just completely fall apart, particularly when we're given some vague reasoning about how they're really the bad person. Oh, they're a thief. Oh, they're a cheater, so it's okay to enjoy their suffering. It sounds pretty harsh, but you really have to consider what specifically you're getting out of something like this that you aren't getting out of other things. The appeal is in the fact that this is real and raw. This is our selling point. And I think this led pretty naturally to the problem faced by Jeremy Kyle. In the case of Steve Diamond and his complete breakdown, from a consumerist standpoint, this is almost the show working at peak capacity. If we're being sold a show about real world intense drama playing out in front of our eyes, the notion of a man being completely publicly destroyed after being found out as an adulterer is exactly what the show is going for. Of course, an appeal to consumerism doesn't always line up well with our ideas about ethics. Some would say they're almost always totally at odds with each other. And so we kind of have to make that value judgement on a case by case basis. If I can make a bold claim, I think, on some level, we all know there's something exploitative about a lot of these kinds of shows. That a lot of these times, for instance, people will apply to take part because it's a cheaper alternative to paying out for a paternity test, or because they need to prove their innocence of a crime because otherwise they'll be homeless, and not because they really want to be a big public spectacle or they're just not in the right mental state to handle these issues in more constructive ways. But these are issues shows like Kyle's are often predicated on avoiding as much as possible, and I think that ties once again into their inherent appeal. And that appeal is the Frog Pond. Coined first by James Davis, the Frog Pond effect outlines the theory that in an environment of perceived higher performing individuals, lower performing individuals will see themselves as having lesser value, and that the opposite is also true. When in an environment of unsuccessful people, our self-evaluation goes up. Just like what frogs do. In ponds. This comes from the broader field of social comparison theory, and is noted by McFarland and Bueller as often stemming from individuals in highly individualist cultures. And it's easy to see why. Because in an individualist culture, your successes and failures are your successes and failures. Where in a more collective culture we might be the only successful worker and say to ourselves, something is wrong with how this system is organised if I'm the only one succeeding, an individualist can look at this and say, well, at least then I'm doing better than them. And I think if you really examine it for a second, you can see how this rings true for Jeremy Kyle, and this entire field of voyeuristic trash TV. 
Pretty famous, for example, is Kyle's frequent redirection away from acknowledging mental illnesses and disorders in those that take part in the show. I'm quite ill, I've got a back condition so I can't stand up for too long. I don't mean to be rude, love. I have to do this show in the right way. <laughs> if you've got a back condition, why do you spend so much time on it? <laughs> I mean, there's Charles, who's refused to come on stage, isn't he? And he's sat backstage. Charles, why won't you come on stage, then? Cos I'm shy, I don't like cameras. Well, that's great, cos you're talking into one, and your face is being broadcast to millions of people, so why don't you save me time and get out here and face the music? Cos if you haven't done it, you wouldn't need to hide, would you? Come on. Come on. I mean, like... Jeremy Kyle might not have any real qualification in psychology, but he works with people who do. He knows that this isn't how social anxiety works. This is pretty basic, you don't only feel nervous when you're guilty about something. But this downplaying is characteristic of a lot of his work. Here's a segment from spin-off show Emergency Room in which doctors and illness sufferers try to patiently explain their medical ailments while Jeremy insists they just need to stop eating. Since I contracted cellulitis three and a half years ago, my weight's gradually gone up from... I've always been quite big, around 17 to 19 stone. And it's just gone up and up and up since then. Cellulitis is infection under the surface layer of the skin. It spreads really rapidly and it can be a life-threatening condition. So quite often it's a hospitalisation issue and an intravenous antibiotic. He's got this massive skin change. His legs are very edematous, swollen. You almost look like you can't look at that. Uh, okay. I, I completely understand why he's not been able to do it on his own. Yeah. You know, we may not understand why, but we understand. I understand lots of people in the same situation. Sure. Unless you change your lifestyle and stop eating and try at least to mm. do something, you're going to die. I, I don't understand why that wouldn't be enough. Are you with me or not? Um, because of the financial situation yeah. we're in, we can't eat stuff like lean meat and that. We just can't afford to buy it. Mm. So we have to buy you the basic. Mm. And uh, it's not healthy. It's about it? education as well, isn't yeah. it? Bless your heart. It's not just about education. Dude has no money and an infected leg. He needs help, he needs support. He's getting that, the NHS is delivering that. <laughs> This is all capped off by his book, which is called I'm Only Being Honest, a tome of truisms about how society is going down the toilet because of individual lazy people and single mums who are just soaking up all the benefits they get, despite in interviews not really being able to say exactly what those benefits are. It's the kind of do-it-yourself rags-to-riches attitude that can only be expected from the son of the personal secretary to the royal family. Yeah, Kyle also really likes vague allusions to a rose-tinted past when he's describing his worldview. And all of this makes sense. Of course, this sort of simplistic view, where we just kind of ignore systemic blocks like sex or class or mental illness in our judgments of other people, of course that would be a perfect fit for a show like The Jeremy Kyle Show. Because in that is your whole narrative. It's the reason to tune in because the whole show is predicated on exposing these people as failures who have, as individuals, lost when you have not. You're a freak! That's lies. You are a freak! <laughs> That's lies. You are a freak! You didn't have to air your dirty laundry on broadcast television. You don't have any disorder that provokes you to act in unusual ways. You don't have bad teeth because the NHS doesn't pay for cosmetic surgery. There they are. Those are the teeth right there. There's two, two larger teeth. The more we can shrug off the many factors that lead people to act in desperate and irrational ways, factors they may not necessarily control, the more it just becomes the frog pond again, where the biggest frog is the one least likely to become the kind of person who shows up on the Jeremy Kyle show. This is fundamentally, in my opinion, the answer to the question of what the recent cancellation represented, and that is what changed. In the moment of Diamond's suicide, the exposure it received, the response to it, that was truly what was broken. Not the realisation that exploitation was taking place, we already knew that, but further exposing that those being exploited 
were not just abstract individuals who chose bad things and suffered consequences, but real human beings with real issues that could affect their choices and situations. The guy in poverty with a rotting foot might have reasons for his weight other than being lazy. The guy who suddenly killed himself might not have agreed to go onto the show in the most mentally well state. And at that point, the fun is gone. You can't claim superiority over anyone anymore, not once it becomes apparent they are facing more complicating factors than you do. The frog pond is over, now it's just a load of frogs and just a regular dude standing in the pond with the frogs. None of this is an admonishment to the idea of wanting to help someone correct harmful behaviour. I think that can be a very constructive action, and several shows also popular at the time exemplified it. Benefit Street is a popular UK series that had plenty of valid criticism, much of which I'll discuss in a future video, but it at least showed real care to clearly demonstrate the difficult situations most downtrodden people come from, rather than constantly trying to discard them, even as individuals in it try to help one another. Even returning to Trash TV, frankly compared to a lot of these types of shows, Jeremy's is not the worst. Those red flags I just mentioned exist, make no bones about it, but with its emphasis on post-show support, there is an effort to do more than just present you the bad people you don't want to be like. Nothing comes close to the kind of visceral point and laugh at the loser nature of US equivalents. <laughs> Not having 50 identical episodes of stage trans panic is cool too. And like, why are you calling me a thought? Because you are respected as a thought. I can't respect you as a so loyalty what are you? woman. What are you? I'm a man. And I'm a man too. <laughs> you loved it, didn't you? That's what you But the way it's handled here is indicative of a broader ignorant and pervasive view. One that suggests we downplay our criticisms of larger systems that oppress certain groups for certain reasons and instead redirect everything to the individual. And that brings me to the bigger point. I'll be honest, I'm not just talking about all this frog pond social comparison theory stuff in the name of academic intrigue. And this isn't me admitting, oh I watched and enjoyed Jeremy Kyle too, although I did do that for a time. I also like dash cam road rage videos. Do I am? Do I care? Come on, who are you then? Ronnie Pickering. Who? Ronnie Pickering. Who? Ronnie Pickering. Who the fuck's that? Yeah, me. More so, I'm admitting that this kind of pattern definitely pervades a lot of my thinking, both personally and professionally. I make YouTube videos. It's what I do. For the most part, I do genuinely want to see other people who make similar content to me succeed, and I'm extremely grateful for any views my videos get. But I'm also not going to deny that, yes, I do sometimes get that little jolt of relief when I see my videos being more popular than other videos made by other creators at a similar time. And the contrary also applies. When my videos are getting fewer views than other videos of a similar type, that feels bad too, even if the views themselves aren't really that low. I would like to say that just seeing the raw number go up is enough gratification, but this time last year my videos were cracking out a thousand views max, and I feel barely more secure in their quality now that I can get over 50 times that. It's the comparison that feels good. All this while I know that in reality the forces that made my videos succeed are way beyond simply me as an individual making a really good video. The YouTube algorithm is a hellish beast and honestly I could do a whole video discussing it, but the simple version is as basic as me reminding people that my sky high fascism video, one of the most popular things I've done, had like 2,000 views for months before it suddenly went everywhere. And how did it get there? Because Sky High was trending for some reason, and YouTube threw it in people's recommendations. And then more popular creators like Jenny Nicholson saw it and tweeted about it. And then I just happened to do a video about another Disney film, so people were recommended that too, and that's how I suddenly got a ton of subscribers. 
Did I do things that played a role in my success there? Sure. Were there a huge number of factors outside of my control that led to this occurrence? Also very much so. And yet, I see the number go higher than it does for others, and I feel like I did something right. And the reason for that, or at least a large part of it, is because I am in a system that is explicitly designed to make me feel that way. I'm in a system where I'm trained to live under the assumption that my successes will be rewarded and my failures are mine alone, and to be ashamed when I blame anything but myself for any part of my struggle. I cannot even imagine the frustration, for instance, for LGBT creators whose videos are regularly demonetized and hidden because they specifically discuss LGBT issues. Disabled creators who cannot always meet the algorithmic demand for evenly scheduled frequent uploads. Or creators of colour who for some reason continue to get frequently ignored by the algorithm. Instead, I am taught that the only way to win is to work really hard and ignore that the system even exists. And if I had to think of one of the most effective ways to instill that in someone's mind, I really can't think of something much better than shows that give us endless opportunities to point and laugh at the people who are even bigger losers than us, admonish them for not having their lives more together, and sending them on their way. And while Jeremy Carl is not the worst in this regard, its cancellation exemplifies the flaws behind this mindset. The trash TV myth of hyper-individualism. And hey, look, I'm just a YouTuber. All this is just a theory. But you know what else is just a theory? Gravity. Hey folks, thanks for watching. As I've discussed in the past, I myself grew up in a low-income single mother household, so you can imagine a conversation like this is really important to me. And I can't wait to hear your own thoughts down below, or if you want to talk to me on Twitter at Lacking Saint. If you liked the video, please consider backing me over on Patreon, where you could be listed on the credits rolling now. You can also support me on Coffee for one-time donations. I'm really hoping to switch to one video instead of two for a month so I can really focus on a big project, but that's not really sustainable at my current patron level, so here's hoping we can bump that up a bit, which you can also help with by sharing this around on Reddit, Twitter, or your local Discord server. I'd also like to give a final big thanks to patrons A. Recusant, Kaurara, Evie Rosk, Industrial Robot, Labor Wave Dashing, Malpatuis, Tor in the Exile, with an extra special thanks to Pamphleteer and Leftist Tech Support. I'm doing more regular live streams now, which you can check out over at twitch.tv slash Lacksaint. Finally, thanks once again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. And once again, you can use the offer code down below for two free months of their service. Other than that, love you all and stay safe. Neat. Neat.